Turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Let's ask God's blessing this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you would empower your word and your concepts and help me try to present them effectively, clearly. I pray that you would drive home the truth to our hearts and minds in a new way, in a brighter way, that we might grow up into you in all things. We pray that you would work for the sake of those listening in. All who will hear this message, I pray that it would have an effect for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29, I want you to read it aloud with me, verse 29 through 32, okay? For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. What does that mean? Well, obviously, there are two choices. You can seek, embrace, love, and follow God's counsel, or you are left to your own way and eating the fruit of your own way. Um... Sorry, fellas. I'll stick this thing on here real quick. I hope that uh, it helps you. We're practicing for a wedding. All right. As I said, there are two choices. To seek, embrace, love, and follow God's counsel. Or eat the fruit of your own way. Be filled with your own devices. Now, what does it mean the apostasy of the simple shall slay them, the turning away of the simple shall slay them. The word means apostasy, okay? So the turning away of the simple is the apostasy of the simple, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Well, it, there's a couple of applications here, and it's, it's sort of a double whammy to the rebels, okay? Um, the apostasy of the simple. The turning away of the simple shall slay them. Number one, it means because they see their own way demonstrated and practiced by their own kind. The turning away, the apostasy of the simple. Those who hate God's counsel, those who despise His reproof are the simple. But they're not the only ones. And so what happens is they fall victim to the people who love what they love. They are led away with the apostates. It happens like this. You sit and squirm under the preaching. You resist God's counsel. You don't like authority. And so when there, when there is an apostasy movement, when there's a wave of dissension, you are joined with it naturally because it fills your senses. I mean, it, it meets your, uh, your ideals and your sensitivity agrees. And so uh, your sentiment, that's what I'm looking for. Your sentiments agree with their sentiments. And so the 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 apostasy of the simple, of the fools who hate God's way, draws you away with it. Now, there's another sense. Once it draws you away, you are left to people of your own kind. I've seen this happen numerous times. We've had people who agreed against authority, but when they left, they couldn't stand each other. Um... And so you eat the fruit of your own way in that you fall victim to your own kind. Birds of a feather flock together, they say. But I want to say this morning, feathers come first. Feathers determine flock. You listening to me this morning? I want to help you this morning. Feathers determine flock. Birds of a feather flock together. But feathers determine flock. And you are growing feathers that will determine the future flock. Mm -hmm. Okay? It says the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Well, in the Bible sense, this is poetic. The simple and the fools are the same. 
the turning away of the simple and the prosperity of fools go together. But the godless success that the apostate lusts after draws him away. He sees fools being prosperous. Their prosperity encourages him falling away. I clicked it twice. It must have already been on. Um, so, what happens is they see fools prospering. They themselves want to prosper godlessly. So they are drawn away by this, but then the prosperity of the fools destroys them. They fall victim to their own kind. It's the same as the Bible when it says when lawlessness or uh, uh, iniquity, the word is anomia, when lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Why would that be? If I hate lawlessness, when it abounds, my love for truth would wax hotter, right? Mm -hmm. But the problem is, the, the very uh, principles within my flesh, my carnal nature, that I don't want to go to hell, so I'm going to stay in the fear of God, but when iniquity abounds and they seem like they're doing okay, my love for God waxes cold and I'm drawn away because I think, okay, they're getting by with it. How many times do children stay, you know, they do what they're supposed to do, I don't want to get a spanking, but then they see other people getting by with it, so then they, I'm going to go over here because they're getting by with it, and that's really what I want to do. Mm -hmm. See? That's what it's talking about. And what happens is that they are left then with their own kind. It's one thing to spout your rebellion when you're in a group of people who are not rebellious. It's another thing for you to be with a bunch of rebels, your own kind. About 240 miles from my house is the town of Liberal, Missouri. Liberal, Missouri has an interesting history. Wikipedia has this little article here. It says, Liberal Missouri was founded in 1880 by George Walser, an anti-religious, agnostic lawyer, and former state legislator who wished to create an atheistic, free-thinking utopia. It was named after the Liberal League in Lamar, Missouri, which Walser was a member of at the time. Walser purchased 2,000 acres of land and advertised across the country for atheists to join his town, which would have neither God, hell, church, nor saloon. He wanted a town of upright atheists. He didn't want any saloons. And uh, he just wanted to get rid of God, church, and show that atheism could be good for the sake of good. You know, uh, what they still trying to say. Walter organized a reform school system that sought to promote liberal education free from the bias of Christian theology and had instruction classes on Sundays to replace religious services. The Free Thought University was founded in 1886 with a staff of seven teachers providing regular lectures and hosting intellectual debates. The arrival of the railroad triggered a population boom, bringing the town to 546 residents by 1890. Christian practitioners began arriving in Liberal soon after it was founded, but were initially met with resistance by Walser. They quietly bought homes within the town and began holding religious services, which were interrupted by Walser, and the Christian group later moved to nearby plots of land after being evicted. A new town was established in 1884 by the Christians after Walser erected a barbed wire fence around Liberal to keep them out. Walser eventually relaxed restrictions on saloons in 1887 and churches in 1889, and he later converted to Christianity before his death in 1910. Now, there's more to this story. And so we're going to read another little article here. You like stories? This is a true story. Walser's objective was to found a town without a church, where unbelievers could bring up their children without religious training, and where Christians were not allowed. His idea was built, uh, uh, to build up a town that should exclusively be the home of infidels, a town that should have neither God, hell, church, nor saloon, which is a quote of his own. Some of the early inhabitants of Liberal even encouraged other infidels to move to their town by publishing an advertisement which boasted that Liberal, quote, is the only town of its size in the United States without a priest, preacher, church, saloon, God, Jesus, hell, or devil, end quote. Walser and his free-thinking associates were openly optimistic about their new town. Excitement was in the air and atheism was at its core. They believed that their godless town of, quote, sober, trustworthy, and industrious individuals would thrive for years on end. 
But as one young resident of that town, Bessie Thompson, wrote about liberal in, in 1895, quote, like all other unworthy causes, it had its day and passed away, end quote. Bessie did not mean that the actual town of liberals ceased to exist, but that the idea of having a good, godless city is a contradiction of terms. A town built upon trustworthy atheistic ideals eventually will reek of the rotten immoral fruits of infidelity. Such fruits were witnessed and reported firsthand by Clark Braden in 1885. In an article that appeared in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on May 2, 1885, titled, quote, An Infidel Experiment, Braden reported the following. The boast about the sobriety of the town is false, but few of the individuals are total abstainers. Liquor can be obtained at three different places in this town of 300 inhabitants. More drunken infidels can be seen in a year than in liberal than drunken Christians among 100 times as many church members during the same time. Swearing is the common form of speech in liberal, and nearly every inhabitant, old and young, swears habitually. Girls and boys swear on the streets, playground, and at home. Fully half of the females will swear, and a large number swear habitually. Lack of reverence for parents and of obedience to them is the rule. Uh, there are more grass widows, grass widowers, and people living together who have former companions living than in any other town of ten times the population. A good portion of the few books that are read are of the class that decency keeps under lock and key. These infidels can spend for dances and shows ten times as much as they spend on their liberalism. These dances are corrupting the youth of the surrounding country with infidelity and immorality. There is no lack of loose women at these dances. Since liberal was started, there has not been an average of one birth per year of infidel parents. Feticide is universal. The, ph the physicians of the place say that a large portion of their practice has been trying to save females from consequences of feticide or abortion. In no town is slander more prevalent or the charges more vile. If one were to accept what the inhabitants say of each other, he would conclude that there is a hell, including all liberal, and that its inhabitants are the devils. End of article, or the quote. According to Braden, quote, such are the facts concerning this infidel paradise. Everyone who has visited liberal and knows the facts knows that such is the case, end quote. As one can imagine, Braden's comments did not sit well with some of the townspeople of Liberal. In fact, a few days after Braden's observations appeared in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, he was arrested for criminal libel and tried on May 18, 1885. According to Braden, quote, after the prosecution had presented their evidence, the case was submitted to the jury without any rebuttal, rebutting evidence from the defense. And the jury speedily brought in a verdict of no cause for action. Unfortunately for Braden, however, the controversy was not over. On the following day, May 19, 1885, a civil suit was filed by one of the townsmen, S.C. Thayer, a hotel operator in Liberal. The petition for damages of $25,000 alleged that Clark Braden and the St. Louis Post-Dispatch published an article in which they had made false, malicious, and libelous statements against the National Hotel in Liberal managed by Mr. Thayer. He claimed that Braden's remarks published in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch on May 2nd, 1885, greatly and irreparably injured and ruined his business in the Thayer versus Braden case. However, when the prosecution learned that the defense was thoroughly prepared to prove that liberal was a den of infamy and that its hotels were little more than houses of prostitution, the suit was dismissed on September 17th, 1886 by the plaintiff plaintiff at his own cost. Braden was exonerated in everything he had written, indeed. The details Braden originally reported about liberal Missouri on May 2nd, 1885, were found to be completely factual. It took only a few short years for liberals' unattractiveness and inconsistency to be exposed. People cannot exclude God from the equation and expect to remain a sober, trustworthy town. Godlessness equals unruliness which in turn makes a repugnant, immoral people. The town of Liberal was a failure. Only five years after its establishment, Braden indicated that, quote, nine-tenths of those now in, in the town would leave if they could sell their property. More money has been lost by locating in the town than has been made in it. Hundreds have been deceived and injured and ruined financially. Apparently, quote, doing business with the devil did not pay the kind of dividends George Walser, the town's founder and early inhabitants of liberal, desired. It appears that even committed atheists found living in liberal in the early days intolerable. 
Truly, as, have been, as has been observed in the past, an infidel surrounded by Christians may spout his infidelity and be able to endure it. But a whole town of atheists is too horrible to contemplate. It is one thing to espouse a desire to live in a place where there is no God, but it is an entirely different thing for such a place actually to exist. For it to become a reality is more than the atheist can handle. Adolf Hitler took atheism to its logical conclusion in Nazi Germany and created a world that even most atheists detested. Although atheists want no part of living according to the standards set out by Jesus and his apostles in the New Testament, the real fruits of evolutionary atheism also are too horrible for them to contemplate. Article written by Eric Lyons. God will see to it that men will sleep in the bed they made. They promote it. Wherever they go, there they are. So, what are we saying? We're saying that you are building a character. And that character will be yours. And that character will make or break you. That character will sustain you or fail you at critical moments in life. But you're developing it every day. Do you want to, uh, do you want all others living by the principles you promote? To live with you and around you? I do. I say thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But the ungodly don't want that. The, do liars want to be lied to? Do independent rebels want to live with independent rebels? Would you want to live under you? Do arrogant people like to live among arrogant people? Do fault finders want to live with fault finders? Do adulterers want to be cheated on? Do swindlers want to be swindled? Do thieves want to be robbed? Do you want to live under your policies? Do those who dishonor their parents want their children treating them the same? Why do Muslims like to live in non-Muslim countries? And then promote Islam? Do communists want to live under communist rulers? No, they just want to be communist rulers. Do socialists want to be taxed by socialists? Do gun control Democrats want to be without bodyguards and walls around their homes? Why are communists in North Korea afraid of each other? Why do communists in Romania torture their own comrades? It's all the same thing. When men forsake the right ways of the Lord, they are left to eat the fruit of their own ways. When you forsake, you're, you live in a Christian land that has uh, uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic fairly established, and then you feel safe to be an infidel, okay, in that environment. But if we take you and put you in a country where everybody's an infidel, you're going to want to get out of there. <clears throat> Argentina in 1902 was one of the richest nations on earth. Democratic socialism ruined it. Same thing happened to Venezuela. 60 years ago, it was ranked fourth on the World Economic Freedom Index. Now it's 179th. People are starving. Only 10 years, thanks to the Hugo Chavez and the cronies who changed it to uh, the Democratic Socialist Programs. Um, Socialists like socialism as long as they are in control or as long as they are the recipients of other people's money. Biblical Christian communities do not promote socialist policies because they cannot embrace God's word and agree with democratic socialist policies. What are we saying? The principles of God's word are the only smart way to live. When men reject God's word, they reject wisdom. They position themselves for destruction. The destruction comes from the fruit of their own supposed wisdom, which they have chosen against God. Proverbs 129, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the apostasy, the turning away of the simple, will be, which is what they want, which is what they crave, which is what's in their heart, will be their undoing, their destruction. The prosperity of fools, which is what they want, 
the prosperity of the godless, which is what they long after inside, will be their destruction. It will destroy them. Do you know that all enemies of the truth will self-destruct? I've watched it. I've watched people who don't like authority, who don't want a pastor, who don't want, they want a pastorless church, they want a fatherless home, they don't want authority, they don't want accountability. And so they agree with other people. And then they leave. And they can't live, they can't stand each other. Because they treat each other the way they treated their authority. Two selfish people. They want to get married because they both want to get from the other. But when they get married, they can't stand each other because they, they wanted to use somebody, not be used. I pity. I pity these people who build a character contrary to God's word, God's truth, and God's ways because they have to live with themselves. The character that you build is yours. It will be with you wherever you go. And you will eat the fruit of that and it will lead you to flock together with others who agree with you. And when you get in that crowd, they will devour you and you will devour them because it's godless. Turn to Mark 8.27. Even among godly people, character flaws must be uh, evaluated and watched. I want to read you a situation here where a character flaw Jesus rebuked. But we can see that this character flaw nearly was the undoing of a very godly man. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? Now the teacher is asking the students. And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered, and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders. Now, in the other Gospels, he praised Peter for this. Okay? Because Peter gave the right answer. Peter was tuned in to that point. But then, he says, he began to teach them that he must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Now, Peter answering when the teacher asked a question is one thing. Peter correcting the teacher is another. He was in no place to start correcting the teacher. Jesus is the teacher. They are the students. Okay? So now, because he gave a right answer, now he, he presumes upon his knowledge. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Now here's the answer to the problem. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. That has to do with me embracing his idea, his way, the counsel of the Lord, the knowledge of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, choosing that over my own way, my own idea, my own brain, my own sentiments, okay? Peter hadn't fully done that. And so he was charged with uh, savoring the things of men over God. Now, think about this. Peter was probably the oldest of the group. Peter was not just some roughneck. He was raised in a godly Jewish home. He was one of a group of young men one of the older ones of a group of young men who were watching for the Messiah, who had been living a godly Jewish life, and actually recognized the Messiah when he came. He was in a very special elite group that was spiritual enough to recognize the Messiah and follow him. Okay? He wasn't on the low end of the ladder in uh, Ju Ju uh, Judaism, but on the top. He was the upper crust of spirituality in Israel. But, he was an older brother and probably felt the role of protector. 
He was a provider. He seems to be the leader in a fishing business. Okay? The others worked for him. He was a leader, provider, protector. It was a part of his natural makeup. But even that had to be brought under the Holy Spirit. It could not be operated on. It could not be uh, let out and worked out in the flesh. It had to come under the Spirit of God. So, here, Jesus is talking about something happening bad to him. And Peter, very natural, not sinful, not wicked, very natural, steps in to say, Oh no! He's the protector. He's the older brother. That ain't going to happen. But, that was being tuned into earthly things. He, he, he got out of his place. Jesus was the teacher, not him. Okay? So, there is a flaw, a glitch in Peter's character. And Jesus said, if you don't lose your life, if you don't lose yourself, if you don't lay down your way, for the gospel's sake, for God's counsel, for, for following God's way and listening and receiving, instead of setting up pre predetermined, oh, I'm not going any farther than that. You know, oh, this is as far as I'm going to go. Oh, I couldn't accept that. No, you've got you've to break that down and be willing to say, not my will, but thine be done in all things. And Peter hadn't got there yet. And we see that this glitch in Peter's character nearly was his undoing. <clears throat> because what happened in Gethsemane? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be the very similar scenario? And a very similar scenario that, that ruffled Peter's feathers. It got him out of sorts. And to where he was, not, he was not spiritually ready to deal with the crisis because of a character issue that he had not surrendered and brought under the control of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, I pray for you that your faith fail not. Peter had to lose his life in order to save his soul. And so do we. The character you develop will lead you to salvation or damnation. You don't just apostatize overnight. You don't just fall away overnight. You don't just walk along a godly path and all of a sudden fall over the edge. You develop things in your brain and in your heart, you begin to grow feathers. These feathers cause you to flock this way or flock that way. Birds of a feather flock together. And the feathers you allow, the feathers you choose, determine who you flock with. Okay? So when there becomes, there comes a controversy between Moses and Korah. Where are you going to flock? Well, that's determined by the feathers you've grown. Mm -hmm. Okay? The ideas, the feelings, the sentiments, the attitudes that you have grown are these feathers that will cause you to flock with Moses or with Korah. I knew a man who instead of building a godly character of humility before God, loving God's law, being sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, working through His conscience, and being conformed to the image of Christ as represented in all God's Word, he seemed to be mad at the world for not recognizing His greatness. And he used religion to sanctify his vendetta against everyone who didn't do him homage. He thus positioned himself against God because of a previous character choice. I'm also thinking of a man who instead of building a godly character of humility before God, loving God's law, being sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, uh, being conformed to the image of Christ as represented in all the Word of God, he justified his lack of submission to godly authority structure and instead submitted to the desires of his wife. He thus positioned himself against God because of a character flaw he chose. I'm thinking of another man who instead of building a godly character of humility before God, loving God's law, being sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, uh, being conformed to the image of Christ, he wanted to live among Christians and feel safe while taste testing all the devil's dainties. He thus sided with the enemies of truth because of a character flaw he developed. I'm thinking of a man that I knew 
who instead of building a godly character of humility before God daily, loving God's law, being sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, submitting to God's way, he wanted his family to be a Christian. He wanted his family to be Christian while he privately fulfilled his flesh beyond, behind everyone's back. He wanted his family in church. He wanted his wife to be a Christian. He wanted his children to be a Christian. But he himself <clears throat> privately fulfilled his flesh. He thus positioned himself against godly counsel because of a character flaw he chose. I'm thinking of a man, another man, who instead of building a godly character daily, seeking God, loving God, humbly submitting to God, daily bringing his flesh into subjection to God, <clears throat> he had plenty of energy to run, lift weights, self-discipline to stay on the bodybuilder diet, but allowed his mother to clean up his dirty room, did not help her keep a clean house. The house was filthy, the grass needed mowing, the exterior needed repair, and the family was greatly lacking in finances, but his money was used for weight sets and his time was used for his own desires. He thus ended up in apostate because of a character flaw he chose. I'm thinking of a man who instead of building a godly character day by day, humbly submitting to God, loving God, calling out to God for his wisdom, praying for God to grow him in the Lord. He had money and time for expensive bows, guns, and hunting, but not time to pray, read, or help his parents around the house and take the load off his aging mother. He thus became an apostate because of a character flaw he chose. Are you listening? The character you build will position you for eternity. In Luke 16, 24, we have the rich man in hell, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. You made sure you received your good things. You are not eating the fruit of the character you built. Matthew 6, 2, Jesus said, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound the trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Okay? They built a character, and they will eat the fruit of their ways. Matthew 6, 5, When thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Further I send you, they have their reward. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I send you, they have their reward. They will eat the fruit of the character they chose. The character they built is positioning them for eternity. Feathers determine flock. And you are daily choosing your feathers. Proverbs 1.29 For if they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. The character you develop will position you for victory or failure. The feathers that you grow will categorize you with the fools or with the God-fearing. Let me ask you, listen up. Are you daily working at building a godly character? Are you daily working at building a character of honesty, humility? I mean working at it. Are you daily building a character of purity, unselfishness, godly character, honoring your parents and authorities, fulfilling your duty and going the second mile, seeking God and listening to the voice of God's Spirit, contending for the faith once delivered to the saints? Are you daily involved in choosing the fear of the Lord, listening to His counsel and choosing the fear of the Lord? 
If so, you are building a character that does right by reflex. You are building righteous reflexes. And when the critical moment comes in life, when, when crucial decisions come, when times come where you go this way or that way, and the two ways have different destinations, if you have a character that is built on obeying God, submitting to God, honoring God, and doing right by reflex, you will save your soul by taking the right path instead of taking the wrong path. The character I repented of 37 years ago had a destination. It had a destination. And you know what? I've seen some critical crossroads of decision in my life. Where a wrong turn would have left me at a completely different destiny. A completely different destination. And so... I look back at that and say, thank you, Lord. But the fact that at 15 I began memorizing Scripture, the fact that at 15 I began teaching and preaching and winning souls and studying my Bible and praying, Lord, teach me and instruct me in the way that I should go. Guide me with thine eye. Let me not be as a horse or a mule which have no understanding. I began praying, Lord, uh, teach me, guide me. In all my, my ways I will acknowledge you. Direct my steps. Lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Because at 15 I began praying that and seeking that, I began building a character that would choose the path that that attitude goes to. To gravitate to the people of like attitude. I began choosing a character and developing feathers that would cause me to flock to God. Flock to the godly. Flock to the honest. Flock to righteousness. And it has saved me numerous times. Consider Joseph as opposed to Saul. Joseph developed the character of being sensitive to God. And when Potiphar's wife made her move, he fled. That was a crucial moment. And if he had not built the right character, he would have fallen right there. Saul did not build the right character. And when it came to the critical time, he failed. Are you listening this morning? <clears throat> what will your character do when the crucial test comes? I can tell you. It will do exactly what you've trained it to do. It will do exactly what you've developed it to do. When there comes a time of division and, and there's upheaval in the church and there's people taking sides on doctrinal issues, where will you flock? I'll tell you where you'll flock. You'll flock with the feathers that you're already developing. The feathers that you've already got developed will cause you to flock one way or another. And those two different ways have different destinations. Right. Say, Brother Mark, I don't want to fail. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to blow it. Then don't blow it this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow morning, tomorrow noon, tomorrow evening. Don't blow it when it's time to pray. Don't blow it when it's time to read your Bible. Don't blow it when it's time to say yes, ma'am, and yes, sir, to your authority. Don't blow it when it's time to do your duty. Don't blow it when it's time to treat your brother or sister kindly. Don't blow it when it's time to honor your parents. Don't blow it when it's time to tithe. Don't blow it when it's time to witness. Don't blow it when it's time to honor God's ways. Amen. <clears throat> you are developing feathers, and feathers determine flock. I've seen it so many times. I've seen, and by the way, apostasy seems to come in waves. Because you get one disgruntled, they begin to mouth it. And they gather other feathers around them of the same color. And when they finally get enough courage by bolstering one another, then they fly. 
They agree together. And the apostasy of the simple destroys the simple. And the prosperity of fools destroys the fools. Jesus saw the character need in Peter. Even in Peter. But Jesus knew that crucial night that crucial night, if Peter hasn't dealt with this to some degree, he's not going to make it through that crucial night. Satan's desire to sift you like wheat. And Satan knew where the weak spot was. What feathers are you developing? It's amazing how others of the same color recognize it. Who flocks around you? And who do you flock to? Whose company do you want to keep and who wants to keep your company? It's because the feathers match. Do you want to be with the godly, the God-fearing, the zealous, the truthful, the honest, the humble, the righteous? Do you want to be with that group? Or do you want to be with the disgruntled, the lukewarm, the worldly. In high school, I wanted to be with the stomps, the rodeo, the cool cowboy group. I had to repent of all that went with that in order to be where I'm at today. I could not save any vestige. No relics from the past could be saved or I wouldn't be here. My flesh would still enjoy any of that back there because flesh will always be flesh. That's why it's got to be crucified, subdued. It can't be followed. It can't be defended. It can't be justified. It will always be flesh. Your carnal man will always be carnal. You put it off. You rebuke it. You reject it. You deny it. You don't feed it. Because the character you are building is yours. It's yours. And it positions you for life and eternity. Let's stand together. Any thoughts before we pray? Well, I was thinking about what you said about Peter. You know, Jesus confronting Peter here when Peter got out of line was on the issue then that came up there the last night. Peter's confronted with the question, is evil going to happen to Jesus? And he said, no. I'm going to draw my sword and I'm going to prevent it. Je Jesus had already taught Peter sufficient to see him through that trial. Right. But Peter hadn't received it. Right. Therefore, Peter ended up being confused and falling in that critical hour when he would not have needed to be. He had a closed door to certain realms and he wasn't willing to deal with that. He kept that door shut. I'm not going there. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna let God clean that cabinet out. I'm not gonna let God change my thoughts in this realm. And that that very resistance was almost his undoing. Yeah, and whether or not he was conscious of being resistant to what Jesus said concerning the matter, we don't know. But when it came right down to it, his previous idea took over. Right, which shows he hadn't fully let it go. Yes, he had not. <clears throat> yeah. He, he almost could have felt like he was fed to a degree asking if there was any swords and saying it's enough. Like the Lord wanted him to carry that sword to the garden. So it, it wasn't like Well, okay, that's a perfect example. His presupposition and that pre existing error caused him to interpret Jesus' words in the way he wanted to interpret them. Because Jesus was talking of a context not that evening but of future events and if he had listened to all Jesus said he would understand we're not talking about this 
Um, so yeah, that, that's perfect example that, that because I have pre-constructed ideas that I'm not willing to alter, then I interpret things in that way. But even after Jesus rebuked him, okay, if he had been had received the teaching up to that point, he would have been prepared to deal with the castle situation. Okay? Because at that point he hadn't fully fallen until he denied the Lord. Okay, denying the Lord had to do with the same issues that Jesus rebuked him for previously. Um, because Jesus was telling him, this is what's going to happen to the Son of Man. And he said, no. Well, I'm not going to let it happen to you. I'm not going to let it happen to me either. Right? So, Nor am I going to acknowledge you while it's... I mean, if that's going to happen to you, I want, to, I want you to know that I'm going to acknowledge you all the way through it. But Peter had not accepted that it was even going to be allowed, and therefore it threw him off. And it was an underlying thing that, underlying enough that Peter didn't. Peter told Jesus, "I'm ready to go to prison and die with you." That was his profession. That's what he told everybody, and that's what he thought. But because of those underlying principles, that you will fall back on your reflex position hadn't been dealt with. So in the front, you felt like, in, when time was good, you felt like this is what I would do. Yes, I sent to that. That's right. That's what I would do. When it got real hard, you you that all goes. The facade leaves, and you revert back to. Patterns that you created. Patterns that pattern that you created. had not been made. You had not made a new pattern in that area to fall back on. And that's why when are patterns created? When are feathers grown? Day by day by day. Those patterns are created day mm -hmm. by day by day. You are creating patterns in everything. So what's the fruit going to be? When that, when that comes to, when it ripens, when it comes to fruition, when it's allowed to play out fully, then what's it going to look like? When you end up being in a crowd of people who believe just like you, what's that crowd, where, where are they going to go? The turning away, the apostasy of the simple is going to draw you away. Where are you going to go? That's the concern. Let's if ungodliness began to prosper, <laughs> if you saw the ungodly prospering, if you saw apostates prospering, what would it do to you? Would it embolden you? Would you go that way if it prospered? That's what we're talking about. Let me tell you a very good habit to develop. And that is, if in doubt, fall on your face before God and cry out for deliverance. If you are in doubt about a direction, or even if you're not, if you don't have clear direction, uh, if in doubt, don't. If you don't have clear direction, if, if there's a choice before you, pray about it. Always. Be in, be in dialogue. Be in communication with the Lord. Um, if you don't know where the Bible, the verse is, you don't know what the Bible says, you don't know, it's like, I don't know what to do in this situation, God does. And if you have a habit of always seeking Him and crying out to Him and asking for guidance, you're going you're gonna to be saved. You're going to make it through. God will not fail those who just want to please Him, just want to do it His way, want His mind on it, and are glad to do it. God's not going to fail them. It's, it's when you don't really want to pray about it because you kind of know what He's going to say. Mm -hmm. Let's stand together. So I'm